So for the next half hour, we're going to co concentrate on the role of data in development. The World Bank Group collects and analyzes a massive amount of data that is used around the globe in efforts to tackle poverty. My colleague, Raka Banerjee, works with the Development Data Group and will be leading a deep dive discussion on this topic. Over to you, Raka. Thanks so much, Trevor. We're going to be spending the next 30 minutes taking a deep dive into data. We'll be looking at some of the innovations that are changing the way that development works around the world. My first guest is Haishan Fu, Director of the Development Data Group. Hi, Haishan. Hi, hi Raka. <laughs> it's, it's always nice to chat about data with you since you are such a passionate believer in data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, my first question for you, Haishan, the World Bank's mission is to reduce poverty and high quality data is critical to achieving that mission. So what does data look like in our world today? Well, the data world is changing very fast. You know, just last week, you and I were chatting and you reminded me when the world is getting digitized, we actually are getting datafied. Um, so it's really a datafied world we're dealing with. Um, there's so many zero and ones around us and each of us is being transformed into zero and ones. And, and those data, digital data has become a real productive asset if you look at the private sector or kind of currencies with, with, with which they continue to expand their reach and influence. So this is really a world that uh, we have to learn about and we have to get to know how to really navigate and, and, and uh, really seek the benefit from it. Um, just, just the other day I was reading, someone was saying um, the next generation come to the, uh, come online will become data rich before they become economically healthy. Mm -hmm. So this remind me that um, my, our colleague Tarek, remember Tarek, mm -hmm. uh, the data s <laughs> uh, chief data scientist at the Rockefeller Foundation used to remind me, Hai Shan, the future is here, but it's very unevenly distributed, which I cannot disagree. Because if we look at the data world, while there's so many more data generated uh, uh, in the private sector through digitized means, when you look at development data mm -hmm. produced by the government sectors, there's still so many blank spots on, on the global maps, right? Yeah, we're, ta true. we're talking about poverty. And just two years ago, our colleagues uh, Umar had a study and showed that s over 70 countries, low income countries, still do not have sufficient data for us to really gauge whether poverty is changing and how and what are the drivers of, of poverty reduction. And uh, worse still, that um, data are often so scarce when you need it most. Just this morning, uh, our colleague Heather, the, the, the survey specialist, reminded us when it comes to asset and consumption within household, we know so little mm -hmm. and we can't really uh, gauge how we can really help to reduce uh, gender inequality in this realm. So those are only some of the examples that shows that while we have so much data on one hand, we are really having such a challenge to get some of the basics right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's this, there's a real scarcity in many places and yet, you know, there's this profusion of data. So it seems like every day we're hearing something about big data and technology and how it's, you know, transforming everything. How is it affecting the way that we work? I think um, just over the past five years after I joined the bank, we can see that bank is really transforming itself in, 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 in dealing with the development data challenges. Um, to me, I think we have come to terms with this uh, priority. That is, we must pursue the fundamentals and the frontier at the same time. Well, I am as enthusiastic as many others uh, looking at the cool and new data and, and data applications and uh, trying to understand their applications how we can best use them. I'm also a firm believer in, in the fundamental data produced by the government's data systems. You know, data produced uh, through census, through public uh, administrative systems, through uh, surveys, um, as well as uh, uh, other um, means, are a foundational layer of the data that we must have when we look at the development and how decide how we can really design the right programs. And so I believe that we need to continue to support client countries. The challenge here is how we can use the digital technology to transform how we produce this data. 
Um, and so, so this is why I was very happy this morning hearing uh, our uh, colleagues Ruth Hill from uh, Poverty GP mm -hmm. uh, emphasizing how much, uh, how hard they're working to support countries to use the new tools such as the survey solutions and allowing us to capture data in a much efficient way and transform it to the cloud and in order to aggregate them and do the quality assurance and also to generate the result uh, much more quickly to how we can really um, innovate um, using other uh, smart uh, phone technology or uh, mobile uh, da phone data to integrate with, with those data to generate new insight. This is why I'm so excited. Um, just um, two weeks ago, I went to a user conference in San Diego around uh, the application of uh, geospatial data software. There you can see public data generated by government systems along with citizen generated data along with geospatial data all of them coming together when they're integrated they really allow us to solve so many development problems in such a way that gave us timely insight and direct us to right place to to uh, to provide the right uh, interventions so this is why I believe that we now must look at data in its totality. Understanding it's not just geospatial, it's not official, it's not just private, but it's really all this data coming together when they can be integrated to serve different purposes. This is the world we have to navigate and this is why there's so much to learn when it comes to what kind of approaches we can offer to our client countries. That's why I really enjoy being in this profession because <laughs> every day I'm learning so much more. That's so inspiring. I mean, basically, it's sort of a version of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? When we're bringing together traditional data, big data, all the different types of data. But you, you also reminded me to get to know how to transform the conventional data business, how to leverage new data sources and new data require us to invest in our own people, mm -hmm. in, in our own capacities, in innovative ideas. It's not just about how we can support client countries, but also within the bank, mm -hmm. we must invest so that we can become the connectors of those new data and new digital technology applications with the practical development problems on the ground so that we can really allow us to do much better in supporting countries to navigate what this new digital world meant, what are the benefits, mm -hmm. and what are the, uh, the, the risks that we'll need to manage. What about the bank's convening power? Um, there's so many players in the data world, so you know, how does the bank work to bring these different uh, stakeholders, partners together? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm really glad you're mentioning this because um, our own learning in this, in this past number of years could uh, achieve a lot of result precisely become we have been connecting not only with our client countries but also the new partners be it in the private sector civil societies and so on and so forth um, because it's really uh, at this critical juncture public sector and private sector have a lot to gain from each other. Mm -hmm. um, not only that we can learn from private sectors, you know, how to um, use those new data technologies and look into the potential of the data they generated for higher social good and, and serve higher uh, social purposes. But also we need to work with the private sector to understand how those data could be governed. Uh, with the benefit from those digital data comes with a whole host of risk from uh, privacy to misuse to the harms that we could uh, uh, bring about to, to the individuals and, and to our societies. So this is why it's so important that we have to learn from each other but also to join forces mm -hmm. to deal with those challenges. Um, another very important point um, is that um, to tap into the potential of the digital technology, we also need to realize there's so much inequalities when it comes to data, meaning the public sector is uh, trading behind the private sector in terms of the speed with which we generate data and, and uh, produce uh, actionable insight. We also have low income countries and countries in fragility that trading behind mm -hmm. uh, in, in even generating most basic data mm -hmm. uh, for us to, to gain develop insight. We also have marginalized groups and, and a group being discriminated uh, throughout history 
are much less visible still um, in, in the data we generate. So this is why we have such a role to play in, in really uh, address those uh, data inequalities and data deprivations. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to, I feel almost overwhelmed thinking of all of the, you know, all of the different avenues in which we need to go, but uh, it's so exciting to think of what we can do when we pull together these different groups. Yeah. Uh, just one thought about data governance. Um, you know, what is the bank's role in sort of pushing forward with that? Uh, I think um, on one hand that um, we need to be much more vocal and visible in, in raising awareness of the issues. And at the same time, we also need to build real relationships in order to join forces to create uh, new solutions. Here I want to mention that uh, we have launched a data collaborative initiative precisely to help bring the public institutions uh, such as ourselves and, and, and other international organizations to, to come close to private sectors. Mm -hmm. And through um, um, pilot testing legal agreement and also addressing what is the safe and responsible way of accessing the data in order to offer um, this new um, potentials to our client countries in how to use those data. And through this, we'll be gaining the best practice and, and uh, critical use cases to inform how we can come to terms with a global uh, governance based on uh, universally agreed principles and values. Thanks so much, Haishan. Thanks so much for being yeah. here. Uh, next, we're going to talk to our colleagues, some of my colleagues, about data innovations and how they're opening up new ways to reach better development outcomes. But before that, let's watch a short video that shows one way that we're using data at the World Bank. Here's a question. How many humans have ever lived? What's the total number of people who've ever been born? The answer is about 100 billion, and right now there are 7 billion people alive on Earth. That means 7% of the people who've ever lived are alive today. But wait, how in the world do we know how many people there are in the world? That's where demography comes in, the statistical study of human populations. And be warned, this stuff gets complicated pretty quickly. Here's the basic idea. If you know the population in one year, and you understand how it changes, you can estimate what it will be in subsequent years. Let's suppose we want to know a country's current population, but we only have data from five years ago. To estimate the population now, we take the old population, calculate the births and add them, calculate the deaths and subtract them, add all the immigrants, and then subtract all the emigrants. If we have these numbers and they're reliable, our estimate should be good. In 1958, when the UN projected today's population, they were out by less than 5%. Pretty impressive. How many other 50-year projections are that good? That's demography at work. We try to get data on population counts, births, deaths, and migration every few years from censuses and other national sources. In reality, all these sources have errors and missing data. This is a real problem in Africa right now, where only a few countries have complete official records on births and deaths. This is where statisticians and institutions like the World Bank and UN come in. They help countries improve their data and make it usable for others. To explore further, you can download 50 years of country-by-country -country population data from the World Development Indicators online. Oh, and how do we know how many people have ever lived on Earth? We just run the process backwards. Welcome back. In this half hour on data, I'll be joined by my colleagues, Sydney Gourlay, survey specialist, Ben Stewart, geographer, and Malara Virapin, senior data scientist. Hi, Sydney. Hey, Rock. <laughs> so we've worked together on household surveys quite a bit, and you're working at this very cool nexus where traditional meets innovative. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the new technologies that you've been incorporating into your surveys? I would be happy to. Yeah, so the team, I work with the Living Standards Measurement Study, uh, which is a unit here in the development data group that produces um, household survey data. Uh, but my job as a survey specialist is uh, kind of identifying and validating new technologies that can be integrated into a household survey framework. Um, so we look at various aspects of primarily agricultural data, at least in my, uh, my role. Mm -hmm. um, so we are currently testing different ways of measuring soil fertility um, in the field. So with avoiding the laboratory setting, which is quite costly um, and time consuming, uh, we've now integrated GPS uh, measurements, so mm -hmm. we're integrating that technology into all of our national household surveys. Um, and we have recently also started looking at using satellite imagery uh, to measure agricultural productivity, for example. Oh, wow. That's a whole gamut of different things. Um, 
So can you tell us a little bit about how this methodological research works? <laughs> yes. So. Uh, historically, through agricultural and household surveys, data is collected through uh, simply asking the farmer or the respondent. Mm -hmm. um, but we've found more and more that uh, there are some biases, some errors in this farmer reported information, mm -hmm. um, which is natural and it's uh, right. We're all human. S survey respondents are human and they are prone, <laughs> to, prone to making some errors or rounding certain data points, which can actually have a quite quite a significant impact on agricultural data as a whole. So like rather than saying I had 1.25 ounces, you would just exactly. say would one add. or something. Yeah, or uh, as we see in a lot of cases, people round up. Mm -hmm. And so that can really bias your estimates of uh, food production, mm. right? which... Um, Does that matter? Why do we care about Yes, we care about that very much. <laughs> uh, we care about it very much, actually. Uh, the majority of the world's poor are, are centralized in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so rural poverty is really kind of the target uh, for a lot of poverty reduction po policies. Um, and agriculture is the primary means of livelihood mm -hmm. in those rural areas, of course. Uh, so understanding kind of the, the level of agricultural productivity or food production um, and the kind of the drivers of uh, of agricultural productivity. So mm -hmm. how can you increase, how can you use policy to increase food production um, is very important, especially if we're trying to get at achieving zero hunger, for example, in the SDG agenda, mm -hmm. um, or re reducing, eliminating extreme poverty a as a whole. Uh, so agricultural data is very, is very critical. Yeah. Um, so in order to come up with the best way to collect this data, uh, we start small. Um, we start small and we compare the traditional methods of data collection, as we do in the national level surveys, with these new methods. Um, so we start on a, a pilot scale, so we can compare directly the status quo of mm -hmm. data collection vis-a-vis uh, -vis these new methods. And then we can have a direct comparison to see what methods work, uh, how feasible they are to integrate to a larger scale, mm -hmm. um, and what impact that has on potential policy outcomes. So basically, you start small, you see if it works at the small level, then mm -hmm. you scale it up to the national level, and then hopefully we're going to have better data for exactly. po better policy outcomes. Exactly. So can you talk a little more specifically about like one, one example that you've worked on in sure. improving uh, agricultural data? Yeah, so uh, Uganda is a good example. We've recently done a study um, where we've worked with the Uganda Bureau of Statistics mm -hmm. um, and Stanford University in attempting to use satellite imagery to measure uh, maize production. Oh. So to see if we can measure, actually measure how much maize is being produced from space. Um, that's a method that's actually widely used in high-income countries, mm -hmm. as it is, but that knowledge is, is very concentrated. It's not evenly distributed across the globe. Okay. Uh, so we are trying, basically taking a method that works in, in high-income countries like the U.S., for example, and trying to adapt that um, and implement it in a low-income uh, country context like Uganda. Um, so in that project, we... Uh, Again, using this comparison, we compared our traditional means of measuring maize production, mm -hmm. which was asking the farmer, how much did you produce, um, with a uh, objective measure from the ground. So we, our teams go in and we harvest a portion of the maize from a farmer's field for that um, ground-based, more the true measure. Okay. And then we implemented um, two versions of a satellite imagery-based estimation. Oh, wow. Okay, so we have one is just asking the farmer. Mm -hmm. Second, we've got you going in, harvesting the, the field. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Exactly. And then the satellite measures. And then the two satellite measures, one of them is uh, based purely on satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. So there's some crop modeling, but there's no ground data at all. Um, to see if that would work, then you, could, you wouldn't need household surveys to measure agricultural productivity mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, the other method, the last method, is a satellite imagery model, but mm -hmm. it, that is incorporates ground data. So it's using, it's combining this, the ground data from the crop cutting or the harvesting mm -hmm. uh, with the, the satellite imagery to come up with a calibrated model. Okay, and what, did, what worked best? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are several interesting findings. I think the one, I'll give you two, because I know, uh, one interesting finding is the result of the status quo 
method where we ask mm -hmm. the farmer. And we find that that actually results in a very severe overestimation of farmer pr production, hmm. um, especially on the smaller plots, uh, which are generally linked to the poorest farmers. Hmm. Um, so that suggests that in general, the traditional methods kind of overstate the level of productivity and food security of the poorest households. Hmm. So we think they have more than they actually have. Yes, That's uh, which is good. a problem for yeah. policy. Mm -hmm. um, and the second main finding from this, the integration of the technology, uh, when we use the satellite model that ignores uh, any household-based data, um, you end up again with a very severe overestimation of productivity. So in the realm of one ton per hectare, mm -hmm. um, which is very significant considering that the average in this area is about one and a half tons per hectare. Oh, so wow. you're really uh, severely overestimating. But, uh, and the main punchline is that when we include the both, when we include ground data and the satellite data, we get a very um, precise uh, estimate that could be used potentially um, at a wider scale uh, for more frequent, more high quality agricultural productivity data. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Sydney. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Ben. Uh, ben, you're a geographer yep. and you use geospatial data in your work. Yes. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how your field has been changing as these technologies have become more readily available? Yeah, thanks. It's uh, So I'm a member of the Geospatial Operational Support Team, or GHOST, here at the World Bank. Uh, <laughs> we've been uh, working hard over the last couple of years to really integrate the use of geospatial information into the real operations of, of the institution. I think something like the LS LSMS use of geolocated ground data and satellite imagery are good examples of really trying to scale up the use of geospatial information. Mm -hmm. I think for, for a long time, the bank has has had some pioneering attempts to leverage geospatial data in the research side of the bank. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of integrating that into operations is always a much more difficult task. Bringing things to scale has the ability to affect more people, but in the same way, it becomes a lot more difficult. Absolutely. So our team sort of, we, we try and do both. We try and um, in some ways bring simplified tools to our client countries and to our bank staff to improve the use of geospatial and the collection of geospatial information while also trying to push the boundaries on research and doing more advanced analytics. Some, like some, something like the, the satellite imagery analysis you're talking about is the kind of stuff we're interested in. Um, Can you talk a little bit about yeah, uh, some of the operational so work I, that you've I, I, I think the first one I'd, I'd like to talk, because it relates to this sort of survey question, is a program called GEMS that's run out of the Fragility and Conflict Group. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a fairly simple concept, and a lot of a lot of times the implementation of sort of data smart policies and, and, and smart use of data is about implementing existing technologies in places that aren't already using them. So in this case, the, the project is, is focusing on geo-enabling, and the idea is to, to teach our, our, our clients who are already going out to the field to monitor projects to simply collect locational information when they do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they'll go into the field with a smartphone, similar to what's happening in the, in the surveys, collect a, location, collect a location, latitude and longitude, uh, every smartphone can do that. There's, there's almost no technological or hardware in, in, in investment. Um, and in many cases also snap a picture, right? So if you've invested in something, new highway, new school, right? Snapping a picture of it is, is the best way to sort of assure that something's actually being completed in this area. Now this project really focuses on training clients, right? We like to make bank staff aware of the tools. They're open source tools, they're very easy to use, but really the goal is to train clients. And in the last year, they've trained a thousand clients in over 25 countries. Oh, right? This wow. is really, really- and When you say clients, who, who are we So these would be about? people in, uh, uh, we were talking about this earlier, I'm trying not to use too many acronyms. Uh, we really focus on, uh, uh, partners in, in, in developing countries, mm -hmm. and specifically in what we call the project implementation units. So okay. these are the, our partners in government who are really re responsible for the monitoring of projects. I see. So they're, re they're regularly commissioned to go out and check on projects, and our, our goal is to say, hey, if you're gonna go out, collect this data. Um, and as an example of the kind of data we're talking about, um, there's a project in, in rural Azerbaijan to do a series of small investments in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And in the bank's repository of project locations, which many research institutes consider to be the best amongst the developing organizations, we had five project locations for that project. Oh, uh, wow. After a week of training and two weeks of data collection, they had over 2,000 project locations. Everyone with latitude and longitude, everyone with a photo of the actual completed information and a status. So if you think about That's amazing. monitoring <laughs> and evaluation, if you think about you know, Im I impact evaluation and future planning, this kind of data really sort of revolutionizes the kind of work we can do. It's basically a very small investment can generate a huge payoff. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. That's what it seems. Well, that, that uh, nicely segues into a sort of a, a different aspect, but a different project we're working on that really sort of talks about this idea that small investments in information can really bear great, great benefits. Mm -hmm. um, a completely different project looking at least cost electrification planning. Right? Okay. So we're so we're developing these least cost. So I'm working with a group out of SMAP. The uh, it's a trust fund what based. Is that? SMAP stands for it's an energy. Energy <laughs> group at the bank. Okay. I can't, I'm not entirely sure what it stands for. <laughs> uh, but they've developed this great project called the Global Electrification Platform, which we're hoping to launch in September, mm -hmm. um, to develop uh, least cost electrification plans for all countries uh, with less than 90% electrification. And this is to develop a, a policy level uh, uh, guidelines for how to achieve a universal electrification. Right, mm -hmm. and it's, it's there's a real focus on on open data and open tools and capacity building. We've, we've run we've run four trainings in the last two years, two in South Africa, two in Italy, to deliver the tools and deliver the methods to our clients because the models that we're generating vary dramatically based on our assumptions and the quality of our data. Hmm. So for every country, we run about 150 scenarios um, varying several parameters. You know, it's when we launch, there'll be a, a complex diagram of all this sort of information. <laughs> but to me, the real takeaway is that um, the quality of the data and the assumptions can change in ve uh, proposed investment by billions of dollars. Hmm. Uh, in Malawi alone, the, the, two, the scenarios vary from the grid investment cost ranging from 200 million to 2.3 billion dollars. Right? This is a two billion dollar difference. Now we're not attempting to prescribe what is the correct solution, but we know that some smart investment in data will yield fantastic results. Right? So if we can, if we can you know, the bank is starting to move in that direction by understanding that Investing in data is, is important and necessary for our projects, but there are also spill-on effects, right? A lot of the information you're looking to collect for some projects is valuable in other locations. Mm -hmm. So for energy, you're looking at grid infrastructure. And if you're talking about agriculture, um, increasing yields in agriculture can only lead so many benefits if there isn't power for processing plants, right? How do you, how do you really raise the development prospect if there's not, you know, electrification in those areas? That's great. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and now I'll go to Malar. Um, so we've been talking about throughout this econathon, but about how data is so important for the World Bank's work. Um, and we also care a lot about data being open, free, and available for everyone. Uh, and you are basically at the heart of this effort. So can you say a little bit about why this is so impart important? Hello, Raka. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you've ever Googled and uh, you found World Bank data, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, as a data scientist here at the data team, it's, uh, it's, it's my job to make sure these data reach, reaches your hands. Uh, and most of the data is open. Um, and there are many definitions for open data, but in the most simplistic form, uh, it's basically data that anyone can use uh, free of charge and continue to reuse as well. And, um, Open data has been at uh, the heart of our data strategy since the launch in 2010. Um, and while we continue to make a lot of our data uh, more openly, uh, I think a critical part of the strategy has been uh, the support we've provided for over 50 countries in helping them open their, their data. Oh, wow. And, um, and, and I think um, also that openness does not uh, our commitment to openness does not stop with just sharing data. It's also about sharing uh, our code and our algorithms as, uh, you know, for, in, for instance, if just imagine the transformative power, uh, you know, the data itself can have if we share some of these tools that we're developing in a more open format, you know, in a way for, in a, a way for us to show how we are producing these insights for social and economic development. Um, and also, I think uh, the other example is the uh, 2018 Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the World Bank's first completely re reproducible uh, publication. Oh, wow. Um, so can you say what, and, that, uh, what does that mean? Sure, yeah. <laughs> if, so we have about 180 annotated uh, data visualizations mm -hmm. showing the country's progress uh, towards uh, the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And uh, each of these uh, visualizations are, can be uh, reproduced, and all of the code is available in GitHub. Uh, and it's to, for us, this is a signal for us to show that that's the direction we want to move in. Um, and also you want to kind of think of it as, uh, as a great equalizer, you know. Uh, you have all these new techniques that are coming, new types of data sources, uh, and you, 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 want this to, you want that to be able to be able to share among, uh, you know, everybody in the world. 
So for us, we have this, it's almost a slogan, uh, but it's more than that, is the open data, open code, and open knowledge uh, to be able to bring everybody uh, you know, into the conversation, uh, have everybody contribute, and nobody dominates in this equation. That's, I mean, that's really fantastic. So basically, it's not just open data, but you're also making it possible for people to do the analysis themselves and basically reach that knowledge themselves. Yes. Right? So sort of this broad-based empowerment. Um, what about uh, the effect of public participation on data-driven decision-making? Um, you know, what's the role of the public and how is this helping empower them? And, and that's, that basically comes to uh, some of the discussions that have taken center stage more recently. Uh, you know, it's kind of like data only matters if it is used. Uh, you know, I mean, you may laugh at me. I mean, it's not a tremendously new insight, but, but, but it, it kind of is. Uh, you know, we know for a fact now that research tells us that open data has improved the quality of public service in, uh, you know, 20 African cities. Uh, we know that open data has made a difference in, uh, you know, battling Ebola in Sierra Leone. We know it has improved corruption in Brazil. Uh, and then one of, the, I think, the most transformative uh, sort of example of sharing data is the GPS coordinates uh, that was released for civilian use. And to put it in context, uh, if today if that service were to be broken, it's estimated there'll be a loss of about 96 billion. It's sort of the, you know, you want to look at it in the context of not sharing data or opening up data. Can you say but more about the 96 billion that would be So lost? it's 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 the release of the GPS data for civilian use, which is mm -hmm. what has completely transformed the way you have access, you know, to the GPS coordinates. Oh, or, yeah. you know, if you were to completely shut down that ecosystem, like if that data were not to be shared, yeah, you know, just the ec economics around that mm -hmm. would would be like the 96 billion. Yeah, stuff, and that right? that ties into that ties into that exactly ben what he's is doing the work that Sydney is doing, and then the work that everybody's doing around agriculture. But the point being that we've established all of that, but we've also established the fact that the release of open data has far outpaced the use of the data. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a cyclic effect because if you're not using the data enough, you don't know where the gaps are, and you can't really divert your efforts to fill those huge data gaps. Uh, and as part of this, the bank is uh, actually committed to, uh, has been already supporting over 30 countries on data literacy programs around the world. As we speak, actually, we are, uh, we are running programs in Myanmar and Nepal, um, mm. where we are creating mass mobilizers, uh, working with different stakeholders, uh, academic institutions, NSOs, civil societies, statistical offices, line ministries, I'm sure I'm not even covering all the stakeholders, <laughs> uh, you know, improving their capacity to uh, have a voice in the, co in the development process. Um, and, and I will end with like one small point, um, which is a, it, it's about data governance and management. Uh, it's a boring topic, not everybody likes to talk about it, but uh, I think it's really critical uh, in, in making sure we use data effectively to integrate the principles of interoperability, openness, and privacy mm -hmm. up front instead of thinking of it as an afterthought. And I think World Bank has a, has a large role to play in all of these efforts. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to all of you. And that brings us to the end of our deep dive on data. Uh, now back to Trevor. Thanks, Raka. There is just so much to appreciate in that conversation about making data great again from the Development Economics Data Team. Now, it's time to hear from our audience. Welcome back. I'm joined by our social media specialist, Fahir. Welcome, Fahir. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you so much. Um, if you just tuned in, uh, please make sure that you answer the poll that we have that we posted earlier, asking you what is the biggest development challenge countries face today? Uh, so far, job creation has been the top choice and the top answer. So make sure you keep voting. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you think the um, top development challenge is. Uh, so share it with your friends um, and keep voting. Um, we also have been getting a lot of questions about people missing earlier segments. Um, so if you've missed an earlier segment, watch 
tomorrow after the event concludes. We'll, the replay will be available then. So don't worry if you've missed any of the other segments. It's all going to be there. Um, so be ready for that. Uh, I also want to give a few shout outs to a few people. People have been really, really engaged and it's been incredible, not just with us. They've been engaged with one another, which um, we find really great. And this is why uh, this conversation is here. So I want to say hi to Harsha from India. Um, uh, Rukaya Kane said, uh, great content. Thank you, Rukaya. Uh, Paul said, great to be part of this conversation. Great to have you in this conversation, Paul. Uh, thank you and keep watching. Uh, Maurice said, hey everyone, this is great. I'm sure that by being together, sharing ideas about this econathon, it would be great to bring improvement to our society. I thank you a lot, World Bank and other partners. Thank you so much, uh, Maurice. This is really great. Um, as far as other comments we've been getting, we say hi um, uh, to Sunaina from Indonesia. Um, also, we want to say hi uh, to Shumis from the Maldives. Um, and so many more uh, people have been commenting. So keep commenting, uh, tag us at World Bank and hashtag Econathon. Wow, it's really great. So Fahir, we'll be checking in uh, regularly throughout. Uh, hope to see you later in the show. Absolutely. Thank uh, you, Trevor. And thank you. Now on to a hot topic. How does trade liberalization impact poverty, income, and inequality in a country? To get more perspective on that, I'm joined by Bob Rikers. Uh, welcome, Bob. Uh, why don't we uh, get, actually, uh, before that, Bob Rikers from the Development Economics uh, uh, Group in the World Bank. So, Bob, how does trade liberalization benefit a country uh, in terms of reducing poverty, inequality, and boosting shared prosperity? Thanks for having me, Wednesday uh, Conaton. So, when countries liberalize, typically prices tend to fall. And that's very good news for consumers because it means that your shopping basket becomes cheaper. Mm. But at the same time, for people selling goods, lower prices are bad news. Mm -hmm. So if you own a farm or a firm, you typically see your nominal income go down. Similarly, wages tend to fall. But on balance, we find that those consumption gains tend to outweigh the income effect, so that on the whole, on aggregate, countries tend to benefit. But of course, there can be distributional impacts, and some people stand to lose, even if on average incomes go up. I see. So I guess uh, to that last point, there's a concern as uh, countries increase trade li liberalization, while they may be richer and overall uh, better off, that in fact, within the country, you may see some uh, rises in inequality. Is that true? That's a very valid concern. So in our work here at the World Bank, we've studied precisely this question. And so for 54 low and middle income countries, we study what would happen if they were to fully eliminate their own tariffs, their own import tariffs. And what we see indeed is that on average incomes rise by roughly 1.9 percentage points, but inequality tends to go up. So, and that's because income losses tend to be very concentrated, whereas consumption gains are widely spread. So while you consume many, many different produ products, you only have one job. And if you lose that job, of course, that's a big, big loss. So that in turn creates a lot of inequality potentially. But if you look at inequality on the whole, from a social welfare point of view, uh, it depends, of course, a lot on the context, but in most instances, in, in most of these countries, in fact, in 45 of these countries, we find that they would be better off if they were to eliminate their own tariffs. Eliminate their own tariffs. So, which leads to my next question, raise tariffs or uh, increase trade? What's better for a country and its people? It depends. So, on balance, in general, we find that reducing tariffs is good because it promotes trade. It also enables everybody to focus on what they're best at producing. So it creates 
production efficiency. But there are contexts in which, you know, inequality can rise a lot. And so if you're very concerned with this, or if you lack alternative sort of policy instruments to alleviate these distributional concerns, then you, you, you may want to be very, very careful. Uh, and one factor that's particularly important in, in this is the nature of the intermediation sector. So there's a lot of academic research showing that gains from trade often are, are partially uh, absorbed by intermediaries and therefore don't necessarily trickle down immediately to the poorest of the poorest. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about the intermediation sector and maybe what policies or actions a country can take or what does the World Bank advise to, to maybe alleviate some of the downside risk from, from trade or uh, inequality that may arise? So, so th the main concern in the intermediation sector is, is essentially one of competition. So in some countries we see that the intermediation sector is completely monopolized. So intermediation is typically more costly in these countries because infrastructure is poor, so it's just more costly to transport you know, goods from the border to, let's say, a rural area than it, in a country like Ethiopia. That's more costly than in a country like the US. But what you want to avoid is that the people and the firms who are in charge of those logistics charge prices that are higher than they should be just because there's a lack of competition. So enforcing competition policies is very important. Of course, infrastructure in and of itself is also very, very important. So the better your road network, the better your rail network, the cheaper it will be to, to transport Makes sense. goods. Yeah. Makes sense. And uh, really quickly, where, where can our audience uh, turn to to learn more? Is there, are there any publications you might suggest or a website on the World Bank? The many, many websites uh, the World Bank has. Uh, but I think uh, the Development Research Group uh, has, has a website where we catalog our working papers. Many of them deal with these issues and related issues. And uh, I find them very exciting, so I hope they'll, they'll find them exciting too. <laughs> and I do. And actually, we, we have a, a, a bonus round. So <laughs> uh, uh, tell me, uh, in, in your work on um, on tariffs and increased trade. What's the relationship, in, what's, what's the role of developing countries in setting examples or setting some of the dialogue around these issues uh, with, with the developing world? So uh, what, what role do some of the developed countries, what, what can they play in setting uh, some of the dialogue around these, these issues? Uh, there are many things they can do. So first and foremost, of course, the, the way they set their import tariffs, uh, has a huge impact on what is happening in developing countries. So, for instance, when uh, the U.S. gave preferential access uh, to Vietnam, that had a huge impact on, on growth uh, in Vietnam because it allowed Vietnam to export itself out of poverty. So, um, so by lowering tariffs, they could really, really do a lot to promote economic opportunities. Uh, secondly, f f lead firms in developing countries can, I think, set examples by, for instance, imposing labor standards, making sure their workforce is operating in safe conditions, that women don't get discriminated against, that there's no exploitation of, of labor, because we tend to see that sort of those type of standards trickle down through global value chains, and in particular if there's an insistence on these uh, conditions right. when uh, contracts get signed, yeah. that can be a strong incentive for, for developing countries to also pay attention. Great. Well, Bob, thank you very much for joining us. Now, on to our next topic. The World Bank is warning of a learning crisis in global education. Millions of students in lower and middle income countries face the prospects of lost opportunities and lower wages and lower life due to substandard education. More on the implications in a moment. But first, what do students around the world have to say about the future of education?
For centuries, our teaching methods have remained largely the same. Education is about expanding minds, encouraging creativity, solving problems, and contributing as individuals, team members, and leaders. Equipped with the ability to understand the news and the economy, an open-minded, environmentally responsible generation could truly change the world. In the future, we need kids to be able to think critically. We need innovators, risk takers, problem solvers. How is one person supposed to cater to the different learning needs of all the different students? Students' skills must be teased out, developed, and tailored to. Rather than adversaries, I see tradition and innovation as allies in education. Imagine bouncing back and forth between the real world and the virtual world filled with an insatiable zeal for knowledge that is new, egalitarian, and individually curated. Our aim should be forming people who are creative, reflective, and adaptable. And welcome back to Econathon, and welcome to the set, Halsey Rogers, a lead economist with the World Bank's education practice. Uh, so, Halsey, what is the global learning crisis? Uh, I believe the World Bank's World Development Report in 2018 identified this crisis. And why are students around the world facing a, a learning crisis? Well, first, let me describe what we mean by the learning crisis. What we mean is schooling is not the same as learning. So the developing world has made tremendous progress in getting children into school, uh, and yet many of them are just not learning much after years in school. Um, in the World Development Report, we gave the example, for example, if you look at students in three countries, third grade students in three countries in East Africa, you ask them to read a simple sentence, like the name of the dog is puppy, Three quarters of them don't understand what that sentence means. In rural India, when we give them simple two-digit subtraction problems, three quarters of third graders can't solve that problem. And even worse, uh, by fifth grade, still half of them can't solve this simple two-digit subtraction problem. And it's not just those countries. We actually see this around the world. Um, and this really has implications for society as a whole, if you think about uh, a country like Chile, like the average a uh, child will complete 12 years of education, but once you adjust for low quality, and this is in a country that's done pretty well in education, still that's only eight years of education quality adjusted that they're going to achieve. So we laid out a lot of these uh, st statistics about th the learning crisis in the World Development Report. We have a lot of new evidence even since then over the past year. Um, recently we've been doing research that calculates, that, sh that shows that Half of children in the developing world can't read just a simple story of a few paragraphs by age 10. So it's half of children. Um, and every child, every, every, every parent, every educator expects them to be able to do that in elementary school. Um, so it's a real crisis. Uh, in fact, that, that figure is 78% of children in low-income countries. This is what we're calling learning poverty. So you have a learning poverty rate of 78% in low-income countries. Wow. So it's, it's really a crisis. Yeah. So uh, with these figures, can you tell us a bit more about the economic costs of little or no education? Sure. No, the, these, these costs are, are, are very big. And this was emphasized really by uh, the World Development Report 2019 and the Human Capital Project that laid out just how much, how important education is in contributing to, to human capital. And human ha capital is, is what powers growth and productivity and prosperity and shared prosperity in, in societies. Um, it, it, I mean, let me flip this around by, by talking a bit about what the benefits of education and a good education are. Education has big benefits for individuals and for societies. For individuals, 
uh, it, it leads to greater prospects of employment. It leads to much higher wages, higher earnings. So on average, about 8 to 10 percent higher earnings for every year of education you complete. Mm. It leads to uh, gains in other areas like health that then have benefits for earnings. If you're healthier, you can, you can earn more, you'll stay in the labor market. Um, many other benefits at the individual level and the family level it leads to better educated children, which ultimately leads to, to higher education, uh, higher human capital later on. But also has benefits for societies. Um, better educated societies have faster growth. Um, they are better, they, they have more rapid poverty reduction as we've seen in a lot of places around the world like in, in the miracle countries of East Asia over, over many decades. Um, we see that they even have better governance. There's now evidence that when you have more education, more educated communities, their governments work better. You have better service delivery, for example. All, all of these are benefits, and, and part of what we showed in this report is that it's, it's not just the number of years of schooling that matters, it's how much students learn while they're in school. Mm. Um, and you can see this in a variety of areas. Uh, people, when you, when you look in labor markets, um, it's not just your schooling, the number of years of school that determines your earnings. Actually, when we measure the skills, the skills have a big uh, increase and in, they, they increase your earnings even beyond the number of years of school you have. We see this at, at, at the society-wide level too. So when we look at what determines, what drives economic growth of societies, um, it's actually th what the students have learned measured by test scores these future workers, that predicts growth much better than just the number of years in school. So these things matter a lot. So if you don't have education or if you have poor education, you're losing all those benefits, which is what the, the Human Capital Project really emphasized. That's incredibly important. So can you tell us about some of the challenges that are involved with improving access to education and improving uh, learning outcomes that developing countries face? Sure. I mean, there it's really useful to understand what are the barriers to learning? Why, how do we have this learning crisis when kids are in school for so many years? Why aren't they learning? Um, and there, there are three main reasons for that. One is that the problem is often invisible. We don't pay enough. We, until recently, we haven't paid enough attention to learning as a global community. And, and that's because it's what uh, Save the Children has called a hidden exclusion. So when children are out of school, we can see that and, and we focus on it. When children are in school but not learning, it's invisible. Um, you typically, often parents don't know, uh, the, the people running school systems don't even know because they don't have good measures of learning. So that's one problem. Second problem is just poor quality of educational experience in, in schools and classrooms. And that's because learners are often getting to school unprepared to learn because of poverty, because of deprivation, maybe they're stunted, that we know that affects brain development, or they aren't even getting to school because their families are too poor. Another issue there is teachers. Teachers are often not supported well, they haven't been given a good education themselves, um, and, and we see that in, in many ways, they aren't supported. Um, often learning materials don't make it to the classroom, like. Uh, systems will invest in, say, fancy new computers for the classroom, but then they never actually reach the schools, or if they do, teachers haven't been trained to use them. And then management is often not up to the task. These are great challenges and uh, the very challenging situations, and principals often haven't been equipped well to deal with this and help their teachers be more effective. So that's at the school level. And then finally, at the system level, there are all kinds of political and bureaucratic barriers, technical barriers to getting everything working together and supporting those teachers, those principals who are trying to do the right thing at the school level. And that's because, as, as we argued in, in the World Development Report, all the people who affect education, we have many stakeholders that affect the quality of education, right? So it's not just teachers and principals, it's politicians, it's bureaucrats, it's the employers, it's parents, it's, it's civil society, it's the World Bank, it's many others. And the problem is too often those different actors aren't focusing enough on learning for all. They're pursuing other goals. And that can really hurt the quality of education. Uh, if bureaucrats are just worrying about getting the politicians reelected because that's the signal they're getting from the politicians, that can pull the teachers away from learning, for example, from promoting learning. Or if the private sector, if the employers are just saying, we want lower taxes, we don't care about the quality of education because they don't recognize 
the skills crisis they see is because of poor quality education in, in basic education, then that really undermines the quality of education. So those are the kind of barriers that, that get in the way, and we really have to attack all three of those barriers. So what is the World Bank doing to attack some of these challenges and barriers? Sure. Um, one thing is keeping that focus on learning for all children, making sure that, that this isn't forgotten. Um, and we've done this, as I've already mentioned, through, through these measures like learning adjusted years of schooling to show that adjusting for quality really matters, through the Human Capital Index, which really puts it front and center because education is a key component of the Human Capital Index. Um, this new learning poverty uh, measure that we're going to be announcing soon that's showing that half of all children in the low and middle income countries are, are learning poor. Um, so that's one thing is just keep it on the front burner, make, people under, make sure people understand the problem and what's driving it. And then secondly, we have a, a package of, of um, many different instruments to support five main pillars to support uh, countries that are trying to improve their education system. So we want to make sure that learners are in school and prepared, and we do that through, for example, early childhood development programs in health, nutrition, preschool. Um, we have to make sure that teachers are, are prepared and supported, and that means making sure that teaching is a valued career, that it's merit-based, that teachers are well-educated. We have to make sure that classrooms uh, are, are really supportive for learning that the whole classroom experience is supportive. And that means things like making sure you have good curriculum, you have the right learning materials that are, that are the right textbooks, for example, technology that helps the teachers. You have to make sure that schools are safe, accessible places for all children and youth. And that means, for example, inclusion for children with disabilities to make sure that they are fully engaged in the learning process. And then finally, you have to make sure that the, the schools and the systems are, are well managed. And that's often a big constraint. As I mentioned, there are these political bureaucratic barriers. We have to make sure that the systems are supporting all children learning. Well, this is incredibly, uh, I guess, integral and, and systematic approach uh, to address these challenges. Uh, if someone in the audience wants to learn more, where would you point them? Uh, so one, one place is this World Development Report 2018, and I mention that because uh, in this, the, the World Development Report series has been going on for 40 years. This was actually the first one devoted entirely to education, and, and so we think it's a great starting point for understanding the learning crisis, what's driving it, but also how we can solve it. We have a lot of, a, a lot of material about success cases and what we can do to improve the situation. So that's a great starting point. Um, Great. And, yep. Great. So, Halsey, that was an uh, incredibly informative uh, session on an incredibly important topic. I want to thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And I want to thank you. I want to thank all my guests and thank the audience for joining us. I'll be right back for the next hour of Econathon.